So I say, live by the Spirit, and you will not gratify the desires of the sinful nature. For the sinful nature desires what is contrary to the Spirit, and the Spirit what is contrary to the sinful nature. They are in conflict with each other, so that you do not do what you want. But if you are led by the Spirit, you are not under law. The acts of sinful nature are obvious. Sexual immorality, impurity and debauchery, idolatry and witchcraft, hatred, discord, jealousy, fits of rage, selfish ambition, dissensions, factions and envy, drunkenness, orgies and the like. I warn you, as I did before, that those who live like this will not inherit the kingdom of God, but the fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness and self-control. Against such things there is no law. Those who belong to Christ Jesus have crucified the sinful nature with its passions and desires. Since we live by the Spirit, let us keep in step with the Spirit. Let us not become conceited, provoking and envying each other. God's word to us this morning. Now you may be aware of it, you may have heard it, you may not have. But there's an old Cherokee legend, loaded with truth, that goes something like this. Once, an old man and his grandson were walking through the woods, when the grandfather turned to the young man and said, Young one, inside all of us there is a battle raging between two wolves. You have felt it even in your younger years, and I have felt it all my life. One of the wolves is evil. He is anger, envy, greed, regret, arrogance, resentment, lies, hatred and ego. The other is good. He is love, joy, peace, hope, humility, kindness, empathy, generosity, compassion, truth and faith. Everyone has this battle going on inside them. They walked a little further in silence until the young boy stopped and asked, Grandfather, which wolf will win? The wise old man simply replied, the one you feed. Now on a less dramatic note, I remember as a child, we had a fish tank in our living room. It was quite a big one, my dad's pride and joy. The fish got to know when feeding time was, and as my dad approached the tank with the flakes, the fish would follow him to whatever end that he put them in as they waited to be fed. Now for those who keep animals, your pets get to know very quickly when and who it is that feeds them. They will let you know when they're hungry and they will follow you around, just like my daughter. The two verses preceding this passage, Paul warns the Galatians not to use their freedom to feed their sinful natures because it would cause them to destroy one another. The more they feed their wolf, the more it will follow them and want more. He then points to the fact that the entire law can now be summed up in a single command, love your neighbour as yourself, which he then carries on in this passage by speaking of living by the Spirit and keeping in step with the Spirit. So Paul is clearly indicating here an ongoing battle between the sinful nature or the flesh, which he also in verses 17 and 18 connects to the law. Not the new command, the new law of love your neighbour as yourself, the law of Christ, but the Mosaic law, the, the law of the former era that he speaks of, uh, or he speaks against of so strongly in chapters 3, 4 and 6. So we've just gone through a series about what it is to battle sin. And in that series I spoke of legalism and I noted that legalism, or being bound to the law, destroys and divides people. The law of Christ, on the other hand, is life-giving. It restores, it brings people together. Like the Cherokee legend of feeding the wolf, Paul is speaking of which one we feed. If we feed evil, the sinful nature, the flesh, legalism, we become mastered by it, which verses 19 to 21 speak of. 
We literally begin to march to its orders of destruction so that we become conceited, so excessively proud of ourselves that we fight against one another as we argue who is right, not what is right. Yet if we feed good, that is the Spirit of God, we allow Christ to become our master. He doesn't follow us around like a sinful nature, begging to be fed. We invite him in. Or should we say he beckons us to walk alongside him, in step with him, as it were. And as we walk in step with him, he generates in us a desire to hear his voice, a readiness to obey his words, and sensitivity in discerning between our own feelings and his promptings. Now before I carry on, the Cherokee illustration is good, but it has its limitations. Because what it does is it pits evil against good, so they're like for like forces. So I want to remind us all as we move on that this isn't the truth of the gospel. The truth of the gospel shows us that in Christ's death, his resurrection, and giving himself to all nations through the Holy Spirit, that good has already defeated spiritual death, the ultimate evil. There has already been a victor, and he is called Jesus Christ, the Son of God. So even if we continue on occasion to feed the sinful nature, those in Christ who share in the victory, who have the power of the Father in them, can claim victory over this evil because its power is limited. The power of love, that is the law of Christ, is unlimited to those who keep in step with the Spirit as it divinely enables them to produce fruit to God by faith and not fruit to death by the law, the flesh, the sinful nature. To put this in its original context, Paul was fearful that there would be factions in the early church in Galatia. Now this was written around AD 49, this letter. And those factions between Jewish Christians and Gentile Christians would bring about arguments and disputes that certainly would not advance the gospel because God wasn't being glorified. Only their own causes were. An example of how factions can destroy fellowship, unity and holiness within the church, God's people that by his grace and power represent Christ in the world, is by looking at what happened in the church at Corinth some six or so years later in Paul's first letter. We can see here examples of what happens when the flesh is fed, when that wolf comes to destroy Continuing the animal theme for illustrative purposes, I, I've borrowed some helpful language from a writer speaking about what Paul warns against with examples of behaviour within the church throughout 1 Corinthians, which connects rather well to those middle verses in this passage about indulging the sinful nature, feeding it up, if you like. He says that chapters 3, 8 and 10 of 1 Corinthians within the church see jealousy and fighting among themselves. And he likens this to a pack of wolves fighting over a piece of meat. To put that in context today, that could manifest itself in how certain groups or individuals may use scripture or their theology to forcefully drive specific views because of selfish ambition, or maybe that they lack in kindness and patience. In chapter four, he sees the church acting like foolish sheep or strutting peacocks, pridefully thinking that they know more than the apostles. Today's context may see us keep to long-held views or traditions because of pride and admitting that maybe we're wrong, ignoring a prompting by the Spirit to reevaluate certain stances or ways of doing things, lacking maybe in God's peace that we are saved by faith and not by works. Chapters five and six, he describes some of the church as animals in heat with sexual appetites that are out of control, worse than pagans. Today's context may not necessarily see the acts of sexual immorality, although we are well aware in some famous cases that this still sadly happens. But today the temptations to indulge the sinful nature through online content, for example, is very real and still terribly damaging, lacking maybe in God's love and faithfulness and self-control. 
Chapter 6 also sees the equivalent of two cockles fighting for public amusement as God's people begin to sue each other in public. Now today's context could be seen by those outside of the church as discord within God's family as they continue to argue who is right whilst dragging each other down into a street fight. Where is the goodness in this fruit that they are growing? Chapter 11 sees God's people strutting and preening like cats or birds, turning into drunken monkeys, humiliating themselves and others during sacred events. Today's context could be how maybe we behave both in public when we are out and about and behind closed doors in front of impressionable young ones. And, and with my background and the volume of domestic incidents I've had to attend in public and in private, this is one of the most damaging because it normally turns to hatred and fits of rage and, and these destroy many, many relationships. A lack of joy from the Lord can turn into real pain. And lastly, chapter 14 sees screeching crows making much noise but having little to say. Today's context could be a lack of gentleness and self-control in how we relate the gospel to others or how we put much effort into things that God simply doesn't value as highly as loving one another. This is what Paul was afraid of and he urged the Galatians to fight against. The more the flesh is fed, the more the sinful nature is indulged. The more the law is kept over keeping in step with the spirit, the further away from God we move. Hence the series we've done on the habits of discipleship. These habits feed the relationships we have with God through Christ in the Spirit. Do you remember having a plan? Having a plan allows space for the fruit of the Spirit to grow. Being accountable enables that fruit to be shared and enjoyed together. Being consistent in what you do, starting off with those small wins, allows the fruit of the Spirit to grow and not die early because you've overfed it. You've suffocated it. Initiating, starting those plans that we've had, those promptings from God, sounds obvious. But Satan is more than happy for us to have lots of good plans and ideas. He just don't want us to put them into practice. And lastly, but most importantly, trusting God means that as we test our faith, it produces in us endurance. So that even through trials, the fruit will still grow because the roots are thick, they're long, they're deep. The closer we walk with God in the Spirit, the more we become Christ-like. As we are filled to the measure and beyond, it is God who then generates the fruit of love in us as we begin to connect with others. All the tricks and lies of Satan are to do one thing, and that is to sever our connection with God. Because he knows that whilst we're walking closely with the Lord, he does not stand a chance. Now for this week, as I said, we're going to be taking a look at love, joy and peace as the fruit of the Spirit. And how by living and keeping in step with the Spirit, we can grow together in them. So the first is love. And love carries with it rather big statements. John tells us in 1 John chapter 4 that God is love. And then adds to that by telling us that all who live in love live in God. And God lives in them. And the Apostle Paul tells the church at Corinth that the greatest of all gifts is love. Staying with the Apostle Paul again in his first letter to the Corinthian church, he gives us a wonderful picture of what love is in chapter 13. Verses that are used regularly, you know, love is patient, love is kind, and so on. So if this is love, which is the greatest gift, and without it the fruit of the Spirit is incomplete, then the greatest gift is also God. So those who live in God, and God in them, and if you live like that you cannot help but walk in step with each other, would mean God is patient and slow to anger, kind and gentle to all, unselfish and giving, truthful and honest, hopeful and encouraging, enduring 
without end. Which means he isn't envious, proud, self-centred, rude or provoking. But the thing Paul most wants the church to realise is that for all the other stuff, the good stuff, without love, we have nothing. If we have love, we have God. And Paul tells us that love never fails. God doesn't foul those who walk in step with him by his spirit. The next is something that more than anything I've been praying for more than anything I've been praying for over these last few years, and that is the joy of the Lord, the kind that comes from God, the kind that enables Job, whilst losing everything he has, being crushed by Satan, he's still able to say, it still brings me comfort and joy through unrelenting pain that I have not denied the words of the Holy One. For joy, John and Paul tell us, comes from God as a result of faith and obedience. And now, it is this next part that I want us to really take heed of here. Because it confirms the importance of living by the Spirit and keeping in step with the Spirit. The amount of joy, or to use a biblical word, the abundance of joy you receive from the Lord is dependent on how close your walk is with Him. If you're walking with Him like Adam and Eve in the garden, then you have an abundance because there is intimacy there. There's nothing between you. Yet if your walk is like that of Adam and Eve, hiding from God in the garden, still in his presence but putting other things in between you, then he doesn't have all of you. And when he doesn't have all of you, your joy will be stifled. And we know that the battle against sin helps us to not be robbed of our joy. Like that of King David as he cries out to God when the prophet Nathan confronts him about his adulterous affair and the murder of Bathsheba's husband. David cries out, let me hear joy and gladness. Restore to me the joy of your salvation. Psalm 55. As David returned to walk in step with God, with a willing spirit to sustain him, the Lord's joy enabled him to rejoice amidst the troubles that would follow him. There is something the world struggles to understand, finds deeply unexplainable, yet utterly alluring, about someone who has the joy of the Lord in them. A joy that shows itself regardless of circumstance. I was speaking with somebody last week who in the midst of what it seems constant pressure and attack in both a worldly and a, a faith family sense still seemed to possess a joy that could only come from walking in step with God. For me that's infectious. It is something that I have in part, I know, but I want it in abundance. It's also something that is shared without even realising it for those who walk in faith and in step with the Spirit of God. These kind of people naturally attract others. And that, and that joy that is shared is for the believer a real blessing to them. So that they know what the result of faith and obedience is. The joy of the Lord. Faith equals spirit-led Obedience equals keeping in step with the Spirit. And lastly, this week we have peace. Described by Paul as the result of having a right relationship with God and with others. Romans 5. A little like joy, this is fruit that confounds worldly understanding. It goes beyond any logical thinking and it doesn't make any rational sense because it allows the receiver of it to act contrary to the normal responses in times of turmoil. The peace of God, Paul tells the Philippians, will guard your hearts and minds in Christ Jesus, and tells the Ephesians that peace will allow the believer to walk boldly into spiritual battles as it is part of the full armour of God. So here is where I will leave you with part of my testimony and the peace that only enveloped me at the moment of professing faith in Jesus Christ 
but has indeed been part of the full armour that has kept me since. Two full years leading up to the day that I met the Lord for the first time, or should I say acknowledged him for the first time, as I'm sure he'd met with me many times before that, um, but I had no idea who he was. I was enduring terrible nightmares, and I say nightmares because they happened at night, but I wasn't asleep. Several times each week, sometimes of a night, as I closed my eyes to get to sleep, I would experience the most real sensation of something pure evil gripping my throat and sitting on me. Now, during this, the more I tried to struggle, the more I tried to scream or open my eyes, the more this evil would tighten its grip on me. It was terrifying. I couldn't utter a word. Now, after a time, I accepted that this was going to happen, and I learned to deal with it by waiting for it to happen, and then just smiling, relaxing, and slowly opening my eyes. Once I opened my eyes, there was nothing there. But I wasn't able to speak or move during the ordeal, so I couldn't call out for help. It was no less terrifying, but it allowed me to get some rest each night. But listen, this was 100% real, and I've heard many testimonies of people who, who, have, who have had this kind of thing as well. See, I knew what time it was while it was happening. I knew where I was, I knew what was going on around me, yet the moment I laid in my bedroom on my own and closed my eyes, this evil would appear. I couldn't tell anyone because I'd be ridiculed. So it went on for two years. At the time of this happening, my life on the outside was fine, yet inside there was a war going on and I was losing. I had no peace in any areas of my life and I was near to ruining my life and the lives of others with some pretty poor decisions. Then God placed somebody in my life, somebody who had recently become a Christian that I was uh, once close to. Long story short was that that person witnessed to me love, joy and peace in the midst of turmoil, their very own turmoil. And it led me to one night watching a TV programme where there was an altar call. It was then during praying the believer's prayer, along with the woman speaking on the TV, that I experienced the greatest event of my life up until this very day. One that simultaneously removed every ounce of guilt, sin, shame, worry, regret and fear from my entire being, replacing it instead with a peace that absolutely and utterly transcended all my understanding. As I sobbed with tears of utter joy, I looked down and I saw nothing between me and the bedsheets. The load on me was so light after being so heavy that I was floating. The moment I professed my sin and sought forgiveness from Jesus, having faith that what Christ said he would do, he indeed done, I was saved. And in that moment, I knew the love, joy and peace of the Lord. And since then, for the last 17 years, it's been a battle to keep knowing, experiencing, growing in and sharing the love, joy and peace of the Lord with others. After that day, I think it was the next day or the next night, that evil that I now know to be Satan. He tried once more to grab me again. As that vice-like grip tightened around my throat and chest, I remember what someone told me to say and to say with conviction, in the name of Jesus, be gone. They told me that Jesus had the power over everything and everyone, every situation, for the name of Jesus had the power and authority. I said it twice, but I didn't say it with conviction, I'd forgot. I said it in my heart, I said it in my mind because I couldn't utter the words because of this grip around my throat. But after the third time of saying it, and saying it as loudly as I could in my mind and in my heart, and believing it was true, this evil that had been 
for two years constantly with me, instantly disappeared, and it never returned again. The feeling was amazing. Such is the power of the love, joy, and peace of God over the power of evil. Paul says live by the Spirit. Keep in step with the Spirit. And the power of Christ will enable the fruit of the Spirit to grow in you. That of unselfish love, true joy, and lasting peace. This is the nature of God that we strive to feed. So that we would experience the increase of his love for us and in us. So that love would increase in our hearts for him and ultimately all those others that we come into contact with.